it's interesting how you prepare the presentation, but then in the last two days there are so many new things that could have affected what I wanted to say. So I wanted to do an introduction to the introduction before I do the official introduction. Um, so I heard so many interesting things, and over the years, we certainly as the organization learned quite a bit from Kapla and uh, partially and informally used some of the assessment techniques in our programs. Our assessment is customized due to the nature of our mandate and work, and so is our curriculum development for all the programs. So we serve clients who receive services for free, uh, funded by the predominantly federal government. Of the, two pro of the four programs that I'll be mentioning, three are funded by the IRCC, Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship Canada, and one happens to be funded by the um, Alberta government. So the two words that actually are a connecting or doing a segue into my presentation that I heard yesterday and today at this conference are learning differently and breaking down the barriers. That's exactly what we do. We do it very differently from academic institutions and that's why we learn and, um, and um, get ideas from those clinical, clinical assessments and whatnot that we have seen today. But we, because of the nature of our work and, and our clients, that will never go, particularly in the low to middle literacy uh, section of our division of our work, will never go to academic institutions, and I'll explain why. Um, learning differently means uh, uh, customizing our programs to meet the needs of our clients, but learning, uh, uh, the best example of learning differently is actually collaborative work with, ac with uh, academic institutions. One of the programs that I'll be presenting on today is, uh, has been offered for eight years now in collaboration, collaboration with the Bow Valley College in Calgary, uh, Child Care Training for Low Literacy Immigrant Women, to receive certification through the Bow Valley College. So we prepare women to come to the level of vocabulary and understanding so that they are ready to take the course. So that's where, so that's where they are in terms of their soft skills academic skills, cognitive skills. So, we have, now I believe 13, we just received some amendments last week, 13 different bridging programs, six of which are for low to middle literacy women and seven of which are for professional immigrant women. To explain to you how everything has to be customized in our work, um, we do the, combination of the prior learning and our employer needs assessment as part of the overall assessment for the professional programs. But with the low to mid literacy clients, particularly low clients, sometimes our, our assessment is not about the learning, it's about the depth of the lack of learning. So it's totally backwards, like in mathematics when you go in minus areas. So how to actually move them from the total lack of anything to be assessed to being able to follow um, the course and to being able to transition within six months from having no knowledge to actually being gainfully employed. Um, by way of comparison, those clients, if they went through the traditional uh, training, they would go uh, through foundational literacy, pre-link classes, then link language instruction to newcomers, and then they would in, uh, pot potentially, particularly if they're younger, at some point engage in the GED, that would take a couple of years. So their path from zero to Z through the tradi traditional uh, sources would be six to seven years. And our customized program offered them similar type of employment that they would be able to get after all those years for six months. So that's that innovation that I would like to present to you today based on the nature of our clients. So why would our, our clients in the low literacy programs never go to the colleges for help? First of all, they don't have resources. They don't even know how to access resources, right? Then they wouldn't be able to pay for the services. They wouldn't be able to offer anything in terms of assessment of knowledge because it's the lack of knowledge that we are talking about. So we would be working like towards the same goal, but working with a very unique population in our programs. However, there are very 
the predominantly younger women who are very willing to learn and want to work and not live on social assistance. As it happens, on Thursday, the day before the conference, I came to Toronto to receive the ABC, uh, National ABC Life Literacy Award for the food service industry program that I will be presenting to you today. Um, it's the national award that recognizes innovations in foundational literacy and in employment literacy. So there, uh, my message, I guess, is there is, in terms of particularly literacy learners, there's so much to be said about all of us doing our unique Hedgecock concept of doing what we do well and doing it in different ways for different populations so that we achieve the overall goal of transitioning people uh, to meaningful employment. We do that through the educating and preparing clients to be competitive in the workplace and parallelly at the same time simultaneously uh, working with employers and we have a selected, we target employers so we actually find jobs for our clients. We more, more so find jobs for them rather than help them find the first job because of the whole vulnerability and multi-barriered uh, uh, environments that they are, uh, that we work with with our clients. So, for in the low to middle literacy uh, category, we work with we dance our tango with about 50 employers in Calgary that swear by our clients once they are prepared by us and once they hire them. And retention rate, job acquisition rate, as you will see, is quite high. And retention rate is so high. So much so that many employers, particularly in the child care training industry, actually never advertise positions before, we, before they check uh, with us to see whether we have anybody that would be eligible for a job. So I just want to give you a few words of introduction about I brought a limited number of the packages that have the printout of the presentation and the number of handouts. At the end of the presentation, I might explain or answer some questions about the, the handouts, but I just want to let you know that we deliberately prepared handouts because they relate to actual examples of our work and how we, and you will see we actually have participants' notes and um, trainer, um, instructors' observations so that should you find them helpful and useful, you would be able to contact us and uh, we will be very happy to share all resources with you. There are a few here in the front for those of you who might be sitting at the back of the room. So they, uh, I'll give you just a little bit of the listing. So uh, we have included essential skills profiles for the two programs that I'll be presenting on, which is food service, and, uh, food service attendant and child care development assistant. We have provided uh, examples of curriculum for two lesson plans for the child care training in the area of communication and digital technology in terms of essential skills. Employer interview questions because they constitute part of, ours, uh, of our assessment. Intake interview to determine, uh, to determine the skills and attributes of learners to identify their goal setting and, as part of needs assessment. Industry assessment for food service industry to identify the Canadian language benchmarks for those clients. Student learning uh, reflections. Weekly integration assignments for the food industry uh, participants, and I believe we have food service midpoint evaluation form. And we also have some taxonomy um, charts that I will talk about. So, um, so I'll just briefly uh, uh, summarize what I'll be talking to you about. I'll tell a few words about the organization so that I, so that, that I give you the context and our mandate and what we are about. And then I will describe all kinds of barriers and particular challenges and in particular employment challenges and barriers for low literacy immigrant women, how we define low literacy immigrant women. And then I will quickly go through uh, some of the low literacy programs with the focus on the child care training program and food service industry, and then go through the skill development, essential skills, client intake and assessment and ongoing client assessment that we do in our programs. So we are celebrating 35 years next week on October 19th with the big gala in Calgary and you can imagine what kind of stress and hecticity, believe me, frantically finalizing that we are not paying for the event planner. We want to, and we are doing a fundraising event, so we, we want to save all the money for exactly the women in those programs. So we are doing event planning ourselves, which is not a good idea, but <laughs> too late to retract. 
So our vision is that if we empower immigrant women, we will enrich Canadian society based on the number of foreign-born people that live in, in all our cities and in our, all our provinces, and the fact that natural population of Canada directly depends on immigration. So it really is the future of the young generations of immigrant children that we are working towards. Our mission is to gauge and integrate all immigrant women and their families in the community with our values of integrity, equity, inclusiveness, innovation, and leadership. And I just want to philosophically connect the word all in our mission with the value of equity to explain to us how we focus our work and what is it that defines our approach and our success indeed, because we have grown over the last 10 years tenfold. We are now the organization of over $13 million, which for a settlement organization is a huge thing. That all happened because of the innovation and the complexity or, or simplicity of programs that we have uh, envisioned and applied, uh, tested and received continuation of funding for. Our core service areas are intake, settlement and integration, literacy, language training and childcare, employment services with two distinct division, uh, career services division and the local uh, mid-literacy division. We employ over 180 staff now. We just received some amendments and added a few staff and programs. And we receive supports from 1,000 volunteers every day in order to be able to deliver our services. And um, I will touch base on the number of clients who are our current uh, employees um, in the next slide. So what is our uniqueness? What is it that makes us special? First, we are the biggest settlement organization for immigrant women in the country and probably in the world. When I go to international conferences, Canada is, is the biggest and the most sophisticated in everything relating to settlement and integration. Our small services are, sorry? So where do your thousand volunteers come from? Sorry? Volunteers. Our volunteers come from mainstream, uh, or mainstream group. Uh, many of our facilitators in the program, particularly in the programs based in the communities, are actually mainstream volunteers with teaching experience. And uh, the bulk of our volunteers is actually our clients, client, uh, well, based in our client group. Because one of the things that we help integration of immigrants is by while they are looking for what they want to do or for those opportunities to enter our programs, we offer them the opportunity to volunteer at SIVA, to do some work, to support clients, to work at the reception, to take clients from one floor to another, to provide volunteer interpretation services in the languages of their origin and so on. So probably I would say 80% of our volunteers are immigrants and then 20% mainstream Canadians. So, obviously, gender-specific services that we do really well. Uh, part of that is customized holistic approach to service delivery, client-centered model, and in-depth in intake and needs assessments, which is really, for the settlement organization, quite in-depth, and, and the other organizations are asking for our documents. That's how, that's how well-functioning it is for us. We have this wraparound rep, rep approach and support to address clients, not just their immediate needs, whatever the, pro, the, the point of entry for them, whichever program that is, they immediately get all kinds of clients, basic family, social, emotional, employment, and language needs. We even have emergency housing uh, support for our women um, if they are in experiencing abusive situations and want to break away. If, if women come to us on Friday afternoon, just before we close and, and tell us, well, I have received your services in the um, domestic violence uh, program. It's not working. I want to leave uh, my um, spouse or partner right now. And there are no spots in shelters. We don't send them back to the perpetrator. We put them up in a few hotels and motels with which we have agreements to take our ladies. We provide them support for somebody to look, look in on them over the weekend. We give them food vouchers. We give them cab vouchers to come on Monday morning back to us so that we can find them that permanent shelter and bring them back and offer them a variety of 60 different programs so that they be, uh, start their path to independence with us. So that's, that's that wraparound holistic approach. Um, First language and childcare support, we, we have a volunteer core or over, of over 60 to 70 different languages, and our staff actually speak more than 45 different languages. So immediate access to uh, interpretation and translation supports. 
collaborative services with community partners that support our ability to serve more clients by providing them in-kind support through we, have, we deliver services in more than 100 community locations in Calgary. So we bring, because of that gender specific uh, um, customization of services, we bring services to the neighborhoods where clients live. If, if clients have multiple children, don't know, are isolated, don't have uh, uh, um, natural supports, family members, and it would be very hard for them to come to us, we bring programs and services to them through partnerships with churches, particularly in literacy programs with churches, community organizations, schools, and even uh, grocery stores. I believe there are a few grocery stores that had some community rooms that we used. Client empowerment, me empowerment methodology that encourages clients' ability to independently access services in the community. The ultimate outcome of our program is for our clients to leave SIVA and come back as guest speakers or volunteers. We do not drag around clients so that they stay with us, so that we have them on the list of clients if there is no need, if we can expedite their transition to independence and access of other than settlement services. Um, I was just talking about volunteers and members of our uh, staff. Of the 180 plus staff at SIVA, about 80 of them are former clients. So we walk our talk when we invite clients to give opportunities to our clients, uh, when we invite employers to give opportunities to our clients, we tell them how many of our staff are former clients and how they are uh, able and willing and efficient in doing their job with SIVA. And that's how we actually get that credibility and collaboration and uh, commitment by uh, uh, employment partners to work with us. So for the purpose of the presentation, I would like to uh, tell you how we define uh, low literacy immigrant women and, and what is it that we consider uh, as a category of low literacy immigrant women. So they have limited or interrupted education in their home country and limited first language literacy skills, which, which of course immediately impedes their ability to speak the second language because those, are two those two are correlated. They're often from war-torn countries or parts of the world that do not support women's equality and only send boys to schools or where husbands do not allow women to work. Because, not because they are bad, but because that's how life is and, and, and that's, how, that's the values that they live by. Uh, some of them have never held pen in their, pe in their hands. Those are the ones that we categorize in the foundational literacy and the uh, most common countries that they come from are the countries that I have listed. So I just want to see in my notes, is there anything else that I wanted to... Many of them, uh, uh, obviously, they all are isolated, and they have never actually uh, um, enrolled their children in the childcare centers or anything. And for those ladies, their children are actually acting as their interpreters more often than anybody else. And you have probably seen immigrant families where children are interpreting for parents. And you can imagine what kind of a, uh, of a relationship in terms of the self-esteem and uh, respect for parents and overall dynamics between child and the parent that, uh, that uh, brings when situation is, um, when they depend on their children for the interpretation. So, the barriers faced by our client, uh, target clientele in this particular division, obviously, is English language and first language li li literacy. Lack of education in their home country, and that's really, they never learned how to learn. It's as simple as that. They don't know how to learn. Lack of learning skills, lack of life skills, very frequently undiagnosed uh, learning disabilities. Um, Several years ago, we asked and received funding from the uh, federal government for the position that we call learning support. That lady actually works directly with clients that we, I, we don't have the uh, knowledge or accreditation to establish diagnosis for anybody. But we call, we call those uh, uh, learning challenges, not necessarily disabilities. We know that something is wrong, we don't know what that is, but our learning specialists work one-on-one -on, -one on those clients and helps them transition to uh, support services and to finding the program and the service at SIWA that would be best suited for them. 
So challenges that they face, obviously, again, repeatedly insufficient English proficiency, or oral communication, reading and writing, limited academic competency, essential skills deficit due to limited and or interrupted schooling, especially document use, computer use, problem solving skills, all things that are absolutely essential for any kind of success in Canadian society. One of the big challenges is that when they, uh, no matter how we simplify and customize programs, learning vast amount of information in a short period for them is a huge challenge. What we might consider simplified information or small, it's a huge amount of information for them. Steep learning curve can be a, a gratification for them, but it's also a challenge if it's connected with potential learning challenges. And multifaceted needs, cultural challenges and domestic pressures and issues. Uh, many of those women uh, are experiencing um, domestic violence and uh, issues with their spouses, partly because of the opportunity that they seek when they come to Canada to actually become independent, to take, uh, all, uh, to take um, advantage of the rights that they have and to to say, wow, my life and my relationship with my spouse in Canada has to be different because obviously this country is offering me those opportunities. So particular employment barriers, obviously lack of work experience because they have never worked in their home country, let alone in Canada. Lack of understanding of workplace expectations and Canadian workplace culture. Uh, Canadian uh, business culture comes with spoken and unspoken expe expectations of behavior, attitudes and performances which may not align and frequently don't. When I tell you as somebody who has lived in Canada 21 years and came to Canada with a degree in English and multiple degrees and multiple years of experience as an educator, that every single immigrant that came to Canada, whether it's a PhD or low literacy, has experienced deep disconnect in terms of Canadians are very, very kind and very helpful people and very welcoming, welcoming of immigrants. I refuse, when I talk to our clients, I refuse to even address any tiny biases that might be existing so that they embrace the opportunities that Canada gives them. But all of us have experienced some kind of the lack of acceptance because of something that we said, the way we said that, the, the, the tone of voice that we might have said that with. It's just, it's not a criticism, it's the, just the fact of life for immigrants. And we teach them resiliency. We teach them that it happens to all of us and it doesn't mean that people are bad. It means that integration is a two-way street. Immigrants need to adjust and immigrants need to encourage mainstream community to, to adjust and accept them because we all have m many things to offer. And we can't expect mainstream Canadians to just, uh, um, we have to work with them on sharing our culture and knowledge and experiences and offering them to learn from us just like we are learning from them. That's the concept that we promote at SIVA. Lack of supportive community and uh, high degree of isolation, like I said, no natural supports. Very frequently, the natural supports, if they have them, uh, the uh, uh, multi-generation families are sometimes uh, actually uh, a problem for them because there is the relationship issues with their spouses, in-laws, um, in you know, mothers-in-law, fathers-in-law, and sometimes it's really, it's rather than the benefit, it's the impediment for them. Frequently, they are single parents, uh, poor, with extremely limited resources. Uh, they require flexible working hours, but the, uh, the jobs that they can uh, access actually don't have flexible working hours and require, for example, childcare uh, uh, accommodations outside of the regular working hours for the part-time jobs, which they don't have. So that's why we are, we are actually doing um, research project funded by the Stats of Women Canada on alternative options for the childcare training, exactly because of the fast uh, food industry clients that we have encountered have huge problems uh, accessing jobs and enhancing their position in their companies because of the lack of access for, uh, during alternative working times. Employment barriers, hugely restricting hiring practices. Online applications for everything, including cleaning jobs, Psychometric testing, behavior, behavioral surveys, pre-employment testing, for, for example, pre-employment testing for food service industry. 
That's why we can't place them in jobs, but we place them in alternative jobs. Telephone interview used to screen our applicants are often uh, very intimidating. Any person speaking English as a second or third language will tell you that it's so much more easier to speak the second or third language in person than on the phone. The lower the proficiency, the bigger the challenge to speak on the phone. Uh, our clients frequently um, mistake because my phone number is on the client uh, complaint um, uh, uh, sheet. Sometimes if they want to phone in and tell their teacher that they cannot attend language class, they phone me. When they do that, I leave everything and speak to them and try to get that information and, they, and then I convey it to the teacher so that they can practice their ability to communicate their absence uh, over the phone. Employment environments that are ill-equipped to support low literacy immigrant women because of the robust onboarding, uh, uh, robust onboarding training practices. We have spoken to our employers that work with us with this population and they realize how, how extremely they are limited in the processes, tools and resources that they use for onboarding. And that's why they're sometimes at the peak of economy, don't have access to labor uh, force because they don't have uh, uh, inviting uh, onboarding practices. And of course, pre-employment requirement of certification in women's first aid, food safety, etc. So the services for low literacy immigrant women for, uh, at SIVA range from foundational literacy all the way to employment literacy and specific bridging programs for low literacy immigrant women, which we could be the only in Canada, the only agency in Canada that, that offers uh, those bridging programs. Um, one of the reasons why we offer them and why we have, I'll go back to that. Uh, value of equity to all immigrant women. We are about equality comes without, goes without saying in uh, democracy like Canada, right? We all are equal. We, we, can, we, can ask, we can apply for any job we want, right? Whether we can get the job is the question. So we are not, our value is not, we have changed the value and deliberately focused and and, and elaborated on the value of equity as opposed to equality. Equality means sameness. We have that. Our clients need equitable, fair support so that they can get the level of savings and be competitive in labor market. So that's why, in line with that value, uh, uh, 10 years ago we had very, we started with very um, meaningful uh, bridging programs for professional immigrant women. And in line with our value five years ago, we realized that if we, as the only settlement organization in the city, cannot think of equitable, customized programs that can bridge low literacy, just like they can bridge PhDs, we are not doing our job. So that's why we started aggressively with those uh, transitional programs for all women uh, co commensurate to their needs. That's really the equity guides our philosophy. So in 1997, we first started with a foundational literacy program called Pebbles in the Sand, which provide um, ESL literacy program for women who have really never held a pen in their life. So over the years, we have added low literacy ESL programming, pre-link classes, uh, basic link, home visitation, hippie program, hippie stands for home instruction for parents of preschool uh, youngsters. And it's a, it's a home visitation, low literacy, low income support for women in their home so that they can be the first and the best teacher for their children before they uh, start school. And when the children start school, we hire them to, be, to have their first job as home visitors because they learn from their home visitors how to be home visitors in the, in the, uh, with the um, women from their culture. The program is internationally, uh, it's, it's, the program started at Hebrew University. I believe in 19, when I was in Europe, I heard about hippie program. So I believe it's, it exists in 13 different countries. It's very big in um, Australia, very big in Canada, many European countries. Google it, it's a very meaningful program and there is a Hippie Canada, it's a franchise. So we purchase franchise rights and offer program. Many of the, of the colleges might be interested in offering that program uh, to, we offer that program for immigrant women, but it's the program for low literacy and low income. A mainstream, it's a, there is a big component of Aboriginal uh, hippie program. So I would recommend that you Google that. It's a really neat program to have. 
We provide counseling and job search support, and then we provide employment training programs, and then the highest level is within the employment, employment bridging programs. So very quickly, uh, the four programs that have, we, we, we received funding for two more programs just last week for the Lion Cook and, Fa Cook and Fast Track pro program that we are just implementing through the federal government. So childcare training uh, develops uh, foundational integrated skills to certification uh, for the child development assistant uh, with, in collaboration with the Bow Valley College. Modular employment training program is one of the most innovative programs that we have ever uh, put together. Actually, in 2012, I received the same award that I received on Thursday for the food program for the modular employment training. It's, um, uh, we train clients to take different modules that relate to cleaning, hotel housekeeping, or kitchen help, slicing, dicing, mincing, all those things that come, they certainly don't come uh, uh, naturally to me. I had to, I speak English as a third language, but for our women it's a huge, uh, uh, it's a huge achievement to understand the difference between slicing, dicing, and mincing. Um, provide women's health and safety, working with others, all kinds of training, so that they can immediately get into one of the modules while taking on some part-time job and continuing taking other modules. So they have the opportunity to uh, graduate from one or four different modules. And then after that, that is the lowest client, uh, client that we receive. And then from there, they can go into those other programs. But all, all the while, working part-time or full-time in the jobs, that they really don't like, but they have to take as the first point of entry into employment world. And then employment training uh, uh, um, continued, so literacy, uh, retail training uh, for women to work in store, either food, sto food stores or at the base stores or retail stores of any kind. So retail vocabulary, using documents, women's and food safety, working with, with money, cashier training and phone skills. And food service training that I'll be talking about today to work in the service industry by learning a customer relations, and occupation vocabulary, numeracy weights and measures and all those things. Low literacy for immigrant, uh, for childcare training is really low literacy. The food service training goes closer to the middle literacy. So I deliberately chose two different levels of literacy and you will see that the training, so that the, the training from their home countries is quite different. However, when women with, that have a high school education uh, from their home countries come to Canada and don't speak English, it's really a basic literacy issue that we are dealing with. So our holistic approach to training low literacy immigrant women includes continuous needs assessment, changing our approaches daily, weekly, based on the, the needs of the group and individuals with, be, within the group because we have one-on-one -on -one supports for all those women in all those programs every day throughout the training, as, uh, along with classroom training. Learning environments that are based on the uh, expressed needs of the clients, flexible and adaptable programming, integration of life skills into all components of training, building on the established knowledge and building that knowledge, knowledge further, creating a realistic goal and instilling patterns of success into their integration, additional supports, referrals to other services in and outside of SIVA, and creating a safe and welcoming environment. So curriculum tailored and aligned with labor market needs, all our curriculum, we have uh, employment partners being part of the curriculum development and vetting. Occupational specific language development, and I will go into the, how we approach that through the essential skills training, development of foundational and essential skills, customized supports, one-on-one -on -one supports, mentored job placements, coaching and counseling. So they receive mentors outside of the work before, as the pre, preparation for the work, then at work, part of our contact with employers is that they mentor our clients. We have job coach that they have access to during the training and during the job placement, and we have counseling for them as well. We provide job search and job maintenance, so we find them jobs, but within the context of 
they are, we prepare them, we prepare their resume, we show them how to, we do mock interviews with them, we send them to the, we, we walk with them to the interviews, but wait in front, so that's how we chaperone them, really. And we use employment, employer feedback and ongoing follow-up as needed. So, childcare training was piloted in 2008. Very low language benchmarks, as you can see, two, or a little bit higher sometimes, with less than nine years of education. We have uh, women that are 20 years, 22 years with multiple children, and we, we have immigrant women that are 55 years old, were sponsored by their families, and now want to go back to work. And in Canada, they thought they would never be able to do anything. They go through the training, become independent, and choose not to live with their children who sponsored them, but actually go and get their own place and have healthy relationships with their children because they realize that intergenerational setting is sometimes challenging. We had a lady who was in her mid-50s when she graduated. She said, now I know more about childcare training than my uh, daughter-in-law and I can teach her how to bring up children so that she doesn't teach me everything. <laughs> and I can become independent one day. So that was a beautiful encouragement of some kind of independence in a woman. So it's a nine month program. It's a fairly long program, in, in, which includes two months of work experience and we, we take 15 clients per intake. We have graduated 168 clients, cumulative, over the all eight years, we have 89% employment rate. Last year, the uh, last year's intake had 93% nine, uh, employment rate, over 90% program completion, and over 75% of women that have graduated still are in that first job because those childcare centers could consider them the pillar of consistency. If there is somebody who needs to come in and open the door at seven, it'll be a SIVA woman because she's not there to switch to another job, but to appreciate the opportunity, to be respectful, to learn, to be reliable for the co-workers, to be reliable for the owner or the manager of the childcare. They love them because they are so reliable. Can I ask a question now? Sure. Or yeah, too late? please. Oh, okay, so this program has been going on for eight years. Yeah. Uh, is it part of your IRCC uh, settlement contract or this is separate? This one is uh, funded by the government of Alberta and so actually okay. because they have done their very confusing ministry changes, now it has fallen through the gaps so I have been going from one minister to another to complain and to try to salvage the program uh, um, to get the transition while we are looking for the options. In the meantime, one of the amendments that I was just mentioning for which we received new training from the federal government is level two childcare training. So those ladies are well taken care of. If we lose level one, we will be able to actually make them be even more ambitious and engage in level two. And this one will be becoming obsolete according to the, to the the one thing about this program is the child, that childcare providers prefer our clients and truly ask us, do you have anybody, because we, we don't want to advertise. Because of the length of training, they find that our uh, ladies are so much more comprehensively trained. Uh, it's very easy to, for the mainstream women to get the certification uh, uh, through the Alberta Children's Services. I believe that they only need to do two post-secondary courses to get the certification or something, which is very, very short period of time. So. They consider our ladies actually much better trained than the mainstream women. So obviously language and, and occupational skills to, to, to obtain the certification, familiarity with basic needs, caring and meeting the emotional needs of children, child development, first aid, CPR, everything. Uh, program planning, big time they enjoy being creative creating program, they love, like, th their approach to program planning is like a child that, that gets the toy that you always wanted, like, they go so, so deep, so high into trying to excel that they come up with ideas that are totally innovative and their, their um, supervisors tell us that they come with very innovative ideas. So, the program has four distinct uh, stages, occupational language training, 16 weeks of learner-oriented occupational language, essential skills, life skills, computer training, one-on-one -on -one that SIVA does. So we prepare them for the Bow Valley College course so that they can succeed. That's customization. 
Then phase two, it's occupational skills training, 16 weeks of child development assistance certification. I believe that in the last eight years, we have the same trainer for the, from the Bow Valley College that came to SIVA, and family member is an understatement uh, as far as the relationship that she has with all the intakes and all the clients. First, they receive, along with that, first aid and CPR certification, hands-on experience through job shadowing from day one. They do job shadowing and some kind, kind of volunteering and individualized support and tutoring. We have level three childcare training uh, program assistant that is a full-time staff position and helps them from day one to the last day of the ninth month with everything that they need one-on-one. -on -one. Phase three is employment, so now the Bow Valley exits and we do uh, employment preparation, four weeks of workplace readiness training at SIVA, interview skills training, preparation, job search support and related training, and then we place them in work experience for eight weeks with the mentor that has day-to-day -day communication with our staff. Con we continue individualized support, job coaching, and at the end of the, of the eight weeks, about 80% of them stay in the Childcare centers that they have received the job placement. You can ask one more question. Yeah. Um, you in your slide earlier you you point to CLB two as your yeah. minimum. Uh, requirement. Yeah. Did you literally have CLB two participants? And if, if you did, did they could they really handle the Bow Valley training? That's why sixteen weeks of preparation. But that no, you have four. Yeah, but that's just four months. Though. Yeah, but it's a very intensive. See, the reason we started our program, we had immigrant women who would enroll in the same program at the Bow Valley College, and Bow Valley College does a beautiful job, obviously, but the environment was not conducive to the self-esteem and needs of our women. They are in the, Bow Valley College comes to SIVA for that. We don't, we don't send them to Bow Valley College because it's on their turf. They, it's their home. They feel that they can talk to that woman that doesn't speak her language, but it's also the immigrant. It's the equity. What do immigrant women need? And then over the years, on this particular one, when we started this program, we were not as good for as much as we are good in essential skills training as we are now with the food service industry because the food service industry is much more sophisticated. We learned so much more over the years. This one, we changed monthly based on the groups of clients that we had and adjusted our training needs. It's a very hands-on and from day one, they not only receive training by us and it's a full-time program, they go to volunteer and continue uh, building their vocabulary while volunteering in the childcare center. So they spent about 18 hours in the English speaking environment and you know the value of speaking English. If you are in the water, you have to swim or you drown. If you're in the water with everybody speak English, you better speak English with a little bit of body language. So it does work. And I have received many of those questions before. If you want more details, connect with me and I'll send you the examples. So I just want to, oh, overview of the food service program. So I'll quickly go through so that I get to the, I can talk. So we piloted that in 2015. So far, 60 clients we served. It's a three-month program. Because of those challenges with the, uh, of uh, onboarding and having to be certified to actually come behind the counter and do some, so we can't provide them uh, job placement with our partners, which are Tim Hortons, McDonald's, Subway, a and W, and Boston Pizza. But we provide them training with the brown bag uh, lunch for children in schools with the community associations. Our ladies prepare all meeting, food for meetings at SIWA for any kind of graduation for, uh, for all those bridging programs. The ladies in the food service industry provide snacks. You would not believe what kind of food they are able to provide. And we have a very capable certified coordinator that, does, that, that makes sure that they do everything in line with the food standards. 52 employers, so uh, 74 to 80%, 87% uh, uh, employment uh, success rate. We offer 17 training units, um, um, and uh, that include food service vocabulary, training in customer service, essential skills, food safety, standard first aid, even pro-serve training, which is not a requirement, but it is a competitive advantage for them when they look for work. So we include that as well, and Canadian workplace preparation. 
So customization of learning activities, presenting vocabulary by making connections to real life situations, repetition of concepts through different types of activities, abstract concepts, uh, introduction of ab abstract uh, concepts, uh, con oh, concepts, what's wrong with me? Incorporating specific life skills and uh, reading activities based on uh, pra practical information. They are very context rich and integra it's integrated learning. For food, we have kitchen station on the wheels, hand washing, three different, like everything is on the wheels and all of a sudden you see women traveling and doing like everything is on the wheels at Siva so that they have actually a kitchen situation in their classrooms. So, very briefly, so what skills, knowledge and competencies do we all need to have to go to the bank and make a withdrawal from a teller? Canadian PhDs or low literacy? Can you help me out? I have a beautiful listing that I want, to, but please tell me, what are the skills that we all need to go to the bank? Ideas of skills. Memory. We don't think about that. Memory, yes. Sorry? Document. Document use, yeah. Numbers. Numbers, numeracy, of course. So I will quickly, in the interest of time, tell you what we all need in order to be able to withdraw money from a teller. And you will see what kind we all, the t uh, you know, when we go to the bank, we know what we need to do. Whether we are a PhD or a lit literacy woman, we, we need to do document use. Able to navigate the way to the bank, ability to take transit read a map, understand basic directions, communicate with the bus driver, pay for a ticket. Numeracy, understanding money, counting different types of money, coins, bills. Basic financial literacy, managing money, concept of debt, account balance, bank fees. Communication with the bank teller, small talk, clearly communicate needs, answer basic questions about identity and banking history. Document use, have necessary documents required, personal ID, bank card, bank account. Differentiate, and no, differentiate the knowledge of checking versus savings. Technology use, understand how to enter a PIN. Bank, use the bank card. That's the skills that we all have to exhibit. Can you imagine low literacy? How many of those skills do we have to think about when we go in? Very few. They have to prepare for everything. That's the client that we work with. All those skills, they have to think about as opposed to us just going and doing the work, right? So we work with all nine essential skills and in our assessment and in our uh, curriculum development, we refer to, Bloom, to Bloom's taxonomy of learning, which breaks down the foundational cognitive skills in order of complexity from remembering through understanding, applying, analyzing, evaluating to creating. That's how we train our instructors to use, to, to, to develop their professional ability, and that's how we uh, transfer training to our clients. Very briefly, and I have uh, touched this Mosenthal's taxonomy, they call, uh, they call it periodic um, table of learning as opposed to periodic table of elements in chemistry. So it actually breaks down the Bloom's taxonomy in terms of types of requested information, and then uh, under the types of processing, we uh, list what the, they list rather, what a learner needs to do to get the answer, and then the 3D dimension is that the types of um, um, uh, match, I can see, match, right? I can see in my slide, which is what information um, we give to the learner to help the learner find the answer. And you will see some of the, all essential skills are broken down into at least five subsections, five levels of complexity. So in the low literacy, not everybody has to be at the level of five. Level of three, and here's an example, if the zone three of the complexity is sufficient for, for one of our uh, uh, models, then under the types of processing, we don't need to go all the way to the right, we can only close it. And then the way we build the, the capacity of our clients is that we move, we scaffold this to go higher, expand it for different jobs that require more sophistication. So the methodology, obviously, that we use in the, understand the current essential skills of the learners and understand what essential skills the job for which they are preparing them requires and build from what they have to what they need to have in a friendly, 
customized way by controlling the complexity through asking questions, uh, task learners and uh, uh, require them to complete things, being part of the training, making sure that we check in with them so that they understand, never going outside of their level of understanding of the skills so that they don't feel intimidated by the learning, by gratified and excited by that. So scaffold their learning to higher level of requested information depending on the needs. So. Our training programs determine the essential skills and the level of complexity of each of the skills and skills based on the following tools. There is the National Occupational Codes that we have prepared for the two positions that we are presenting, employer interviews, employees on the job observations and the review of authentic workplace documents. And I have attached for you examples of all those in the, on the right side of your package because that gives you a, a actual, it's a, like a, it, there is client observation, um, instructor observation forms and client, uh, client um, uh, notes about how they feel they have come along in, uh, in this training. So I think it's very useful for anybody who would like to uh, use similar concepts or um, use that as an example of evaluation or uh, observation that they want to develop for uh, for the for the uh, clients. We also work employers with employers directly on what they need, so that we include employers' requirements in all those uh, uh, tools that we are using. So, how we are assessing learners? Intake application and in interview to to determine where they are and whether they can be a good match for that for the program that they are applying, and if not, to uh, transition them to a different program or to different organization. It doesn't happen very often that we go to different organization. Nobody offers those programs for low literacy. So we determine eligibility for the program. Uh, we talk about personal uh, documentation, going through the interview with staff. Not only allows the opportunity to, to assess the communication skills, but also helps us determine how committed and capable applicants are. There's nothing you can do if they don't want to cooperate and if they don't want to take the ownership of their action plan. You can't force people to do things. So that's the, that's the given for us. Skills assessment and continuous skills assessment. We set learner goals and observation and informal assessment are a given for all our programs. So ongoing assessment, um, hands-on experience. I was talking to you about the kitchen on, on wheels and those stations on wheels, always integrating um, uh, 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 practical training with theoretical training. Completion of assignments. There are examples of uh, assignments that we give to, lad to ladies after each lesson plan that, and the lesson plans are divided by weeks. So they have to role play, act, uh, do a presentation about the skills that they have learned and use the application of those skills in their innovative ideas and share it with their uh, class. And we actually, our staff goes to those presentations and gives them the applause for some good ideas or maybe provides them with some feedback if, they, if the staff feel that they haven't convinced them about how they use those skills. So it's a very, very interactive style that requires participants to take leadership and leadership development is part of all our programs. It's not easy to stand in front of people and speak in public. It's not easy for Canadians, it's not easy for anybody, and it's certainly not, not easy for clients in low literacy programs. So, I might be actually having five minutes for questions. So why do those programs work for us? Because they are designed specifically to train highly buried low literacy immigrant women for employment via an essential uh, skills methodology. Because we address labor market and employer needs while ambitiously helping marginalized group of clients. We have strong collaboration with partners. We recruit clients and we recruit uh, employers parallelly for everything that we do. We have outreach people who go to employers and tell them about the programs and what we actually, we actually give them the offer that they can't refuse. That's how we attract clients. We tell them, you want to, do, not everybody, you know, Syrian refugees two years ago when they were coming, half of Canada, there was the group of five sponsorships where people were collecting, I believe, $40,000 to put down so that they can sponsor a family. Not everybody in Canada is willing to have that commitment. 
but everybody or majority of people in Canada are willing to support integration of immigrants. They just depend on those of us whose mandate it is to en engage them and offer them the opportunities to give them the offer that they cannot refuse. I love uh, Godfather is one of my uh, iconic movies. So we give them the offer that they cannot refuse. We tell them, you will be part of the success and integration of a, an immigrant family without having to give money, without having to personally have take on any risks, only enjoying the learning and providing the learning, taking credit for the success and forever having a reliable employee. And that's what they take us up on and, what's the, and that's what not one uh, employer came back to us with regret for having engaged with our clients. So strong collaboration with partners and low literacy women are enabled to bridge barriers and secure meaningful employment to support their families within a relatively short period. This really is the final, the final outcome. In six months they achieve what it would take them years to achieve through the regular education. You, those of you who work with IRCC, with the federal government, you know that you can not deliver outcomes to government once and then you will lose funding. So when we get pilots, they take risk in giving you the money, but within, at the end of the project, you either pass or fail with them. If you pass, you evolve your projects from pilot into regular programs, and that's how our clients take advantage of the opportunities. If federal government does anything really well, that's controlling, monitoring, making sure that the taxpayer's money is well spent. So the onus on us to succeed and to move those ladies is so huge that for us, it's, it's, a very, it's a very mathematical formula for us as to how the whole concept of essential skills and how the whole concept of clients having to be part of that process actively, not just passively as recipients of training, is well. You know how I, when I, as a parent of children between 30 and 40 years, I always tell people the secret of good parenting is make them do what you want thinking that it's their idea. So that's exactly what we do in clients. Make, help, give them options, and then once they choose what they want to do, hold them accountable because that's testing their, that, that's testing their ability to work in a Canadian workplace, right there. And uh, 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 give them the hot potato so that they carry it because it's their life and somebody's paying for it. All of our clients have signed contracts with us just like they probably signed contracts with the post-secondary institutions and we hold them very very accountable for like missing a class it's a crime unless there is a really really good reason so that's my presentation thank you very much for listening to me if you have any questions i'll be happy to answer them and if you find any of those uh resources that i shared with you um, um useful for you we are very good at sharing everything that we produce uh, nothing is our, like everything that we have produced has been paid by the taxpayers, and we are very happy to share all the resources. I'm waiting us to have any programs. Sorry? I'm waiting us to have for all those programs, we have massive waiting. I believe for the childcare training program, it's about 50 to 60 ladies right now at this moment. For all those programs, it's a huge waiting list. We had a customized, last year we had a customized employment program for the Syrian clients because of the popularity and, and that was the only program in the history of SIWA that didn't have a waiting list. Because it was, well, it was forced on us, right? It was the priority of the government. It went through and, the, and, and, and we, we actually had to really work hard on getting them to commit the way other immigrants commit. So there is a natural, there is a natural process for everything, including them, acquiring level of commitment that is a condition of the successful training. But huge waiting lists. With this modular program that I mentioned to you, we had, when we started it uh, five years ago, we had hundreds of immigrant women who were Canadian citizens that uh, had come to Canada years ago, but never had anything like that that was offered to them when they were eligible, coming to us and demanding that they, word of mouth is the, back, the, the best promotion. I don't want to be on social assistance. I want to be part of that program. So we quickly went to the Calgary Foundation and told them, this is what we have. We need money to address the backlog. 
We got the money for three years. We got $80,000, and we have actually taken care of all that backlog of citizens, non-eligible clients that are now meaningfully employed. Well, this is how it works. Settlement organizations serve men and women, and there are many. Uh, the thing with the law literature, we seem to be, because of that equity and because of that fairness, we seem to be one of the very rare organizations. Recently, I presented at the Western Canada Conference for the Employment Skills Development in Saskatchewan for the Western Canada, and there were many colleges from Western Canada that uh, presented there. It looks like that not even colleges have, have, have generated meaningful law literacy bridging programs. There was one, for example, for construction workers that they, at the time of the presentation, they had just started at, in Winnipeg. There was one for, and that, was, that one was for men. So the beauty of the law literacy uh, uh, um, concept is that those programs can be immediately used for men if they are low literacy clients in the respective areas of uh, or jobs that they are potentially qualified for. It's very simple. Essential skills are the same. Training of essential skills is the same. You might just want to maybe customize some kind of the approach to soft skills, to family, dichotomy, and those things. But those are all replicable models, right? It's a, and it's a, it's, yeah. There is, there is the organization that has one men's program, Immigrant Services Calgary, but they, they provide counseling for men if they, have, if they are either abusers or men can also be at the, at the receiving end of abuse, not so much as women. But it's not employment related. But certainly th those are all applicable for men as well. The thing is that men have more choices and they certainly have more easy way of accessing programs, if anything, for the simple reason that they would not have to stay at home with children, but rather they would be. You know, when we get newcomers, and if we happen to have a, if there is a, an agency that has one spot for the link program, and there's a couple that just recently arrived to Canada from anywhere in the world, and they uh, have two or three children or one, when that agency phones the family and tells them, unfortunately, we can't take both of you, but we have only one spot for you on Monday. Who do you think will be in the link class on Monday? A woman or a, a wife or a husband? It'll be husband because woman will stay at home to take care of the children until the childcare is available for, for her children, then she can go and learn English. And that's with everything in the family, particularly in the immigrant family. So again, if you would like any for the information, we would be more than happy to oblige and to share. We actually have one of our strategic priorities is giving back and sharing knowledge. And we're actually working with, uh, there's a small organization from, um, from uh, Nova Scotia that found me. They would like to start immigrant serving organization. And we have invited them to come and spend a few days with us. And we promised them we would send trainers once they get their charitable number. We would get trainers to train them. We told them, tell IRCC that SIVA will provide uh, training for your staff and program models and everything, and you will get better outcomes because we have done that for eight years. We now know how to do it, right? And we will train you for free so that you can do the same programs in uh, uh, Nova Scotia as we do in Calgary. And that we consider one of the uh, certainly social responsibility models that we abide by, and we are more than happy to share our knowledge. Thank you very much. Thank you.